Happy Thursday, non-obvious nation. We are back for another episode of the show, and I am so excited to bring on two inspiring women who have been on a journey to help the world become more racially literate, and we are going to have both of them, uh, Priya and Winona, on the show a little bit later on. And as usual, this week, we're going to talk about some of the most interesting and non-obvious stories of the week. And some of you know that this was a pretty big week for me. Uh, I announced my next big book project, which is going to be called The Future Normal, uh, along with my good friend, Henry Coutinho Mason. And we have known each other for a long time, and we did a sneak peek at what this book is going to be. And we're so excited about it. And at the bottom of this page, you can see the URL where you can sign up for the early reader list, but also just watch a short video that we both recorded about the book to learn a little bit more about it. It's going to be a uh, really, really fun effort. And uh, Henry is someone who I've admired for a long time, and I can't wait to just continue that collaboration with him. So that was my big news uh, this week, and I was so excited to share it at an event earlier. And I hope you do watch that video to learn a little bit more about the new book. Let's move into the stories for this week. And the first one that I wanted to share is kind of on the topic of memory. And memory was actually big this week in many different stories that I found. And it was, was so interesting because we're kind of at this moment where uh, to some degree we're going backwards into our memories. And Google launched this new AI service that goes through your photos and helps to identify the best memories and then automatically sends you the 10 best photos every month automatically picked through AI. And it was just a uh, interesting thing to leave to AI to figure out what your best memories are. But it got me thinking because there were, like I said, a number of other stories that all talked about memory as well. Fisher Price launched a new museum on Instagram where they take you through decades of toys. So you can look at the toys from the 70s or uh, way earlier, in fact, as well. Depending on how old you are, you could kind of see the toys that you used to play with and maybe recognize them and have a bit of nostalgia. Uh, as well. Uh, Hilton launched a new campaign to try and get all of us to dream of traveling again. And, and it's been a really tough time for the travel industry, as most of us know, but also just for all of us who love to plan our next trip and who kind of make it through our lives by always looking forward to the next trip. And now for many of us, that piece has kind of been taken away from us. And, and what Hilton found in, in surveys was that more than 90% of people that they surveyed said that their favorite memories come from some sort of travel experience. And you know, we have this same thing echoed, right? Like when I ask our kids about like, what is the favorite thing that you've done? Like a lot of times it's a, it's a trip, it's somewhere that we've been. And so their whole new campaign tries to get people to reimagine going on that next trip and finding where that's going to be. And many, many for many, many people, it's going to be a domestic trip. It's gonna be a closer to home trip as the survey finds. And so getting people to think about that and dream of that is really, really important. This one was more of a quirky story that I found uh, about the ultimate social distancing workspace. And it was a Japanese uh, amusement park that decided to make their Ferris wheel Wi-Fi enabled. So now you can actually go and sit on the Ferris wheel and do your work <laughs> Wi-Fi on your laptop. I don't know exactly who would want to do that. It doesn't seem like the most pleasurable thing to do, but at least you could be socially distanced, right? You could be in your own little cocoon and uh, high up in the air. It sounds kind of scary to me. It's not my thing to do, but you know what? We're getting a little bit more inventive. And I guess for amusement parks, like this is one of those things where like if you can let people work in a different place and we're sick of being home and working, maybe this is like a chance to do something different. Maybe it's a little bit fun. And the last non-obvious story I'll share with you is about a new app uh, and, and platform called Handshake that has been around for some time, but just raised a large sum of money and promotes itself as a way to get more uh, diverse, uh, diverse populations of people who have opportunities to get hired, college students. It's like a the, the article on TechCrunch called it a diversity-focused LinkedIn. And I, I really like the idea of giving a platform that, that allows younger people and, and new graduate, recent graduates to have a place where they can really promote themselves and, and for employers and people who want to hire them to perhaps more easily find them than, than digging through the noise of a platform where everybody's on there. Uh, and so I hope this succeeds. Uh, I think it's a great 
opportunity. And, and it also is a good segue into our interview for this week, which is going to be with two very amazing young people. And I want to start that conversation right now. So now I am very excited to have both Winona and Priya here to talk about their amazing book and their journey, really. So welcome to you both. I'm glad to have you. Thank you for, Thank you for having us. us. <laughs> We're excited. Yeah, me too. Uh, in fact, I was thinking about how I was going to start this conversation. And I think probably the best place is just to to hear from the both of you in your own words about the journey that you took, because I think it's such a fascinating story to even get to the point where you then launched your book. So take us back to the, the beginning of, of that decision to defer college for a year and to go on the journey that you went on. Yeah. Yeah, this, so this journey started all the way back in sophomore year of high school. We were sophomores at Princeton High School in New, in New Jersey. We were 15 years And for old. you, when you say all the way, like how long ago was that all the way? Well, it was like six years, I think. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah, we're currently juniors in college. Um, gotcha, yep. But all the way back when. When we were 15. <laughs> back, when you were, back when you were young, right? Yeah, <laughs> when we were just kids. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that year was the first year that we ever heard a teacher talk about race at school, um, which kind of launched us on a whole path of thinking. I think, uh, you know, there were two two sites of resistance, I think, that we realized early on. Um, one being schools, the kind of subject matter of choose our nonprofit and much of what we've done since then, schools as a site of of change and, and liberation and education and um a place where you know changes uh, are are sorely needed, and then the other side of resistance was friendship, right? It was the the two of us realizing that among our friends, among our teachers, among our parents, you know, communities, there was so little discourse about uh, our racial reality. And for the two of us in that context, it was like to suddenly have a friend. You know, we had gym class together, chemistry class together, history class yeah. together. We have a friend who would talk with us about. Um, about this this thing mm -hmm. right that we didn't understand was a really really huge mm -hmm. deal. So and even just uh, even just talking about it is is uh, sometimes challenging for people, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was. I mean, the conversation between the two of us was hard. We kind of like looked at each other um, and we were like, "Can we share our experiences? Will she understand?" Um, and then it kind of went from us figuring out how to begin asking questions about thinking about our own racial identity, how race structured everything in our school community to expanding beyond the, the just the two of us. So we started talking to peers. Um, we went to our local town area and we're just tapping people on the shoulder, um, strangers, which might sound odd, but <laughs> at this point it was like, you know, we couldn't find conversations about race anywhere, um, not in our classrooms, not in our textbooks. And when you when you tapped them on the shoulder, like, wh what would you say? Well, like, what would you ask them? Like, hey, do you have a story <laughs> about race that you want to share with us? And, you know, there's something also about the two of us being young people. And um, when we started this, we were 15, right? Like having backpacks, we were, we're Asian American. And so perceived as like naive and innocent, right? So people were willing to open up to us um, more easily. And also I think a lot of people, even if they'd start off saying like, I, oh, you know, racism isn't a thing. It's not really real. Um, it, just after a few minutes, there would be memories that popped up from all the way starting from birth to people then like, sitting down on the, on the side of the road with us or on a bench and spending like hmm. three hours, you know, with strangers, wow. like very intimate and personal stories. So we, the timeline of what we've done up till now is we realized that there was something that could be leveraged in terms of using these very po powerful personal um, real stories and bringing them into the classroom. Because if we ever do talk about race, it's like slavery happened X years ago, um, you know, segregation, Martin Luther King, we're good now, right? So if you hear your neighbor or your um, your classmate, your, even your teacher being like, actually, this happened to me yesterday and this is how it totally shapes my entire life. There's power in that. And we ended up pairing those personal stories to systematic research too. So we piloted a textbook, um, we got funding, wrote like a 224 page textbook using that story stat model um, after the pilot session and then fundraised to travel to all 50 states um, where we did the same thing all throughout the country. Um, 
you know, couch surfing, the two of us, Winona said friendship was something we had to explore, right? Like, yeah. Um, yeah, and 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 that's and those stories and, and research and our own personal journey during our gap year during 50 states. Um, that's what's featured and tell me who you are. So you went to all 50 states, you did all of these interviews with uh, with people in different places. How do you decide? I mean, every state is, is kind of a big place. How do you decide where to go in each state? Or do you just kind of go to the biggest city and, and hope that there's the most people there and, and follow that? Yeah, I mean, we're, we are pretty clear if you read the introduction of our book that it's not a representative picture. Yeah. Or- comprehensive picture of the United States. It's very much shaped by our own individual journeys. So how we did it was first we, we put out um, our travel itinerary basically to to all the educators who had, uh, you know, looked into the or used the classroom index to our team of, of 40 or so mentors that we called it our professional advisory board um, to the students that were on our team, transcribers, editors, exactly. And we kind of just asked folks like, you know, do you know, who do you know across the country? Um, in all of these different, you know, communities, uh, and and kind of uh, shaped it around that. The other thing we did was, you know, look up um, uh, significant places across the country with uh, history related to race. We also tried to get a a balance of like urban and rural and suburban, just mm-hmm. different different forms of communities. And um, lastly, we just went online and and we, you know, looked up, you know, like race in racial justice organizations in Tulsa, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you literally you literally Googled it. <laughs> we had a huge spreadsheet, like this huge never ending spreadsheet for each city, mm-hmm. town, state in terms of like who's going to host us, like whose couch can we sleep on? Um, you know, who are we going to interview? Who should we email in advance? Who should we just like show up at, you know? So. Yeah, and I know that that uh one of the one of the things you talk about is humility. So you guys would probably never say this, but like this idea totally took off. I mean, you had a ton of attention for it. You did a TED talk about it. Uh, you became, I think, like TED fellows or some sort of program there as well. I mean, at what point did you realize that this was more than just kind of a personal journey and this was really starting to, to in some ways, go viral? Yeah, I mean, I think it it's never really felt like a, a personal journey, I would say, because from the very beginning, the very first thing we did, as Priya said earlier, was to go to go to town and, and tap strangers on the shoulder, right? So from the very beginning, Choose has always been centered around the model of, um, you know, prioritizing those voices, which which we feel should be centered or often not heard in in these conversations, um, who are closest, right, to the pain of of racial inequity um, and violence. And so, I think in that sense, like. Um, what we try to do in the TED talk, what we try to do in the book, what we've tried to do on our website this whole time has been make sure that we're not centering the two of us and make sure that this is very clearly not just a larger community that um, we have tried to cultivate through Choose, but part of a very long tradition of thinking and tradition of uh, resistance. But also, I mean, I think that question is important because especially today, right, like thinking about models that people can replicate in terms of like, my parents, if they want to get involved, um, Indian Americans, immigrants, like if they want to get involved in racial justice, like what do they do, right? Or like other mm-hmm. young people like yeah. us, where people who maybe like don't live in communities as privileged as Princeton, like these conversations about in terms of when we started getting press attention, when we started getting, you know, asked to do speaking engagements or, or things like that. Um, that was, that was, to be honest, like, hard for us in the sense that we first of all i mean on so many levels in the sense of our friendship was like you know we were always worried about are we being like you know commodified in a way of like superficial images for companies and not like real systematic change are we being taken seriously are we actually changing anything in our schools or is everything kind of just gonna you know disappear after a few years right and so i Mm. think for, for for the two of us it's this conversation about like the extra responsibility that has come over the years with all the privileges of attention, right? Is like, how do we recenter the work? We're always asking each other that. Um, And how do we, you know, on a personal note, like we both are living together now during quarantine and like working on shoes all the time in between classes and after classes and before classes. So like how do we make sure we take care of each other as like best friends, you know? Um, How do we, 
stay true to that like original intent in high school of like, we wanna change our schools. We believe in changing our schools. We believe in our educators. We believe in young people, students. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, that's, that's I think great. that's one of the trickiest things is that balance, right? Of like, for us seeing ourselves very much as vehicles of larger community vehicles of, of the movement, movement, but then also, you know, having this kind of politics of refusal toward instrumentalizing ourselves and for sure never instrumentalizing others, right? Commodifying mm -hmm. others. Realizing. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, one of the things that I think really stands out about this uh, uh, movement, and I really do think it's kind of a movement, is how intentional you are with the things that you put out there for people to be able to kind of take and and reuse to to share those big messages that you want to share. And, and, and I know you have a, a methodology, um, like a theory kind of behind this. And, and the ultimate goal that, that you really talk about is this racial literacy. And so now that you're several years in uh, and you've achieved some of the, the goals, where do you feel like we are on this kind of continuum? Do you feel like uh, there's a lot of progress made? Do you feel like it's kind of gone backwards just based on what's ha been happening politically right now? And, and we're very close to an election uh, coming up very shortly. And so that's kind of another concern that relates to uh, everything you guys have been doing over the last several years as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I, you want to go? Go for it. Okay. Um, I, I think, so going back to, like, you, you put up our theory of change and our belief in schools, um, we feel like racial literacy shouldn't stop outside of the classroom, right? Although, as young people and as students, um, we feel extra passionate about starting there. Um, it, it feels like a clear path to making sure that the people we graduate into society and the world are racially literate so they can start building that racially just and equitable world. Um, so that's where the theory of change comes from. We just yesterday or two days ago launched our educator fellowship where like educators have been creating units and um, lesson plans around racial literacy, kind of doing it themselves, you know, even if they don't get that top down approval. Um, so we're always in touch with that work, but I think in, as a nonprofit, and and even if you look at Tell Me Who You Are, um, these people are everyone you know has been a student at some point. But these people are not just students, educators. They're like cooks, you know. Um, they're artists. They're yeah. on the board. There was a spice spice hunter, a self described spice hunter, on like graphic designer. I want to be that. That sounds like an awesome thing to be. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, we met just all of these people who even companies, right, like who are like tech companies, um, leveraging their unique skills and, and talents and passions for social justice in a way in which we like, our biggest hopes and dreams is that like everybody takes that kind of initiative, you know, beyond just students, beyond just putting responsibility on students and educators. So um, yeah, I, it's a, it's, it's, it starts with schools for us and our, and a lot of our work is focused there, but um some of the most exciting stuff is to see how people are getting creative and um, refusing that narrative of like the solo icon, the the sole models of like protests and sit-ins, which are necessary, but not the only ways in which you can get involved, you know, um, to that question. Yeah, yeah I, I, um, I was just wondering, as you've seen this progress and as you've been working on this uh, with so many other people getting involved, what surprised you about how this has sort of been taken on by by many people or how people have gotten involved. Is there anything that you kind of look at now and you say, wow, we didn't we didn't expect that? I don't know if 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 we were necessarily surprised um, at this uh, because we had experienced it ourselves, but just this idea that we use the terms race and even racial literacy all the time, right? But very few people can very clearly define, you know, what what racial literacy is, right? And to your previous question about, you know, where are we mm. currently in terms of racial literacy as a nation and world? I think it starts there, right? With first defining. And how do how do how do you define it? How do you guys yeah, define? It? I think I think for for us, we, you know, racial literacy definitely not something we invented, right? Definitely something that we're constantly learning, in particular from. Black and Black feminist intellectuals and, and thinkers. And so to answer that question, I think 
maybe just just sharing citing the work of of three people that we admire first is um dr uh howard stevenson who has done a lot of work around racial literacy and talks about it as this idea of reading and and you know he has a book where he goes into depth but reading and, and recasting racially stressful situations right so in situations that demand uh you know a discourse and, and consciousness toward race, what do you do, right? Um, Dr. Ruha Benjamin, who also um, who teaches at Princeton University down the street, um, talks about it as a historical and sociological toolkit to understand how we've gotten here, how we could have been, how it could have been, and how it still can be, right? So history and sociology as something that impacts, you know, everything, you know, every field, including, including marketing. Um, the, the stuff you spend spend your time on. And, and um, thirdly, uh, Dr. Bettina Love, who has a really, really great book we like about the concept of abolish, abolitionist uh, teaching. And, and I think part of the premise that she proposes that we think about very often is, is that schools are fundamentally violent spaces, right? The systems that fail black and brown um, children and, and, and children of mm -hmm. color, you know, are fundamentally um, violent and the legacies of, of violence. Um, and so starting from that premise, I think is to your question, uh, surprising for many that when we talk about something like race and racial literacy, it fundamentally involves something of a, a magnitude and seriousness as violence. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, so much of the way that we, that we learn about interacting with other races is based on those personal experiences. And one of the most interesting insights, I think, from knowing your story and, and and reading the book and and kind of following that that path is that you found a gap in your knowledge and you decided to go and fill it yourself and now you've created this movement to help educators and schools primarily like you said the focus it starts there to fill that gap for young people and for educators who are sort of educating the next generation I wonder, most of the, the watchers of this show are, are um, not in school currently. Uh, most of them don't work in schools uh, right now, but that doesn't mean they don't have anything to learn. And one of the big things that I advocate for all the time is get outside of your perspective, read things that you don't agree with, uh, and really become a lifelong learner. I wonder if you could give people a, a little bit of insight into how they could use the tool if they're not in school, how could they use some of the things that you've put out, some of the tools, some of the, the materials, some of the things that you have shared, aside from obviously going and buying the book, which I think they should totally do. Uh, what else could they do as adults uh, who are in the workplace, uh, who are in corporations to support this movement that you guys have been creating and, and, uh, and promoting? I think, so, you know, I think to, to that question and, and the question of, um, you know, what is racial literacy? I think this model that we've um, thought about, you know, talked about in our first TED talk for racial literacy, this idea of bridging the heart mind gap that Priya talked about uh, earlier, uh, pouring, you know, personal stories to a systematic context is a model that can also be brought to the audience of, of this show, can be brought to, to any space. And I, I think that is primarily, you know, a, a way of thinking about the question of how do we talk about uh, race, you know, that is relevant anywhere. So just to dive into that very briefly a little more, it's just this idea that so often when we talk about race, right, it's on this level of, um, you know, uh, anecdote, you know, or or sentiment as, as mm -hmm. Dr. Benjamin talks about. And, and, you know, that that kind of looks like, you know, this person who is a person of color had this experience or like, I heard this happens to people, you know, um, in this way that can be really important in terms of sharing, you know, personal stories and, and making sure we approach this topic with this type of, you know, compassion and deep centering of the, the uh, of human lives and humanity, um, but then also has the risk of losing out on this systematic context, right, that can be explained through sociology, through history, through statistics, through through all of these things. Um, and so I think, you know, when in companies, when when people talk about, you know, implicit bias training and people talk about, you know, sharing your stories, I think um, the heart mind model is useful to remember that that all has to be placed within a, within a larger systematic framework to, to, to say that we have to understand the systems of how race operates in this country and in the world to truly have a, have a deep and rigorous understanding of racial literacy. 
That's uh, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I just want to um, say I know we're we are getting close to hitting our time together because we have literally squeezed this interview in between your classes, which I uh, am so thankful for. <laughs> um, and I want to make sure and keep us to that because I don't want to be responsible for making you late. Uh, I wonder if we could close with maybe just um, sort of one thing. I mean, we're 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 talking right now. It's it's a couple of weeks until the U.S. election. Uh, which is a flashpoint politically, but it's not necessarily going to change the culture overnight. I mean, our culture is still going to be around us and it's still going to be an evolving thing. And I wonder if we could close with each of you maybe offering one tip for something that everyone who's watching could do themselves to take initiative for themselves. And I think that that is such a, a powerful piece for me, at least, of your story, which is you saw something that that required uh, additional effort on your part, you went and did the effort yourself. You didn't wait for someone to deliver it to you. You didn't blame some someone who didn't give it to you in the first place. You said, look, this is broken. We haven't learned about this. We should have. We're going to go and fix it. And uh, I think that's such an important mentality for all of us to embrace, whether we're in school or, or you know, way out of school like me. <laughs> um, so what is one thing that maybe you could suggest people do to to try and take that mindset and and use it to understand better this important topic of race and become more racially literate? I think to start, um, something that has changed the way we operate in terms of our own sense of agency. This is the first time we can vote for the presidential election, right? We both just turned 21. Before then, we didn't have kind of sponsored, you know, state or even within the school power, right? Just as young people. And I think for people who even who are older, who maybe feel stuck in like the systems that we live in or don't see a path forward, I think something that changed for us is when we were traveling to all 50 states and we went to places like Alabama. Um, Butler Browder, whose story is in the book, he he like looked us in the eyes and he was like, I'm worried for your generation because I think you don't know your history. His mother was the plaintiff in the cases that desegregated the buses, you know, and he was talking about how in reality, it wasn't just Rosa Parks, it wasn't just Martin Luther King, it was a whole community of specifically black women, um, a whole partnership, friendship, um, everyday people doing everyday things that slowly kept things pushing, you know? And I think for us to be like back in high school, okay, we're students. We, you know, kind of like to write. We know how to use a camera minimally. Um, what can we do just starting from our local community, right? So I think to, again, kind of disassemble that narrative that you have to be this icon or um, this monumental figure to have done anything that's worth it is just so wrong. Um, and then the, the, second, the, the second part that I would say in terms of people thinking about the question of simply like, what can I do is to like, I know it's hard with COVID and quarantine, but is again, related to the first point is like to find community, like find friends, find people you can learn from, listen from, whether that's like in, in a book, you know, or if you can't talk to people or, um, or, or whatever it may be, just understand that racial literacy um, is never this process with like a finite destination. You're always learning um, and, and that's your responsibility and it's a joy and it can be like part of what makes your life the most like rich and, and um, yeah, so to, to, to invest, invest in that. And I, that's, I just retweet yeah. what Priya said. <laughs> and I would say, you know, read, you know, uh, even as you said, you know, if you don't, even if you don't agree to just thoughtfully consider the work of, you know, like Angela Davis, uh, of, uh, James Baldwin, um, Cedric Robinson, you know, there's so many, so many scholars. Start in your local community, like find out, like there is the historical societies, archives, even a quick Google search, you know, start, Start local. Especially. Whose land do you live on? Yeah, <laughs> so just start. I mean, that's that's the that's the point, really, isn't it? Uh, uh, take a step, read something, uh, become more educated, and and choose to do it. Right? Uh, don't yeah. wait for someone to put it in front of your face. Also, just a, a quick add on that: um, start with your own identity too. That's 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 really important in the sense of even if it's just like a journaling session where you know, and then you can share it with a trusted friend, like. 
even if you're white, right? Like race impacts every part of your life. So sit there and think about honestly, like, what are my privileges? What are some traumas? What, what, where do I need to heal? You know, um, where, do, what are my responsibilities going forward? I think that sort of self-reflection also, in addition to understanding those around you and your relationships is very important. So important. So important for sure. Um, I want to say thank you to both of you, Priya and Winona. Thank you for spending a little bit of time with me, uh, with our non-obvious nation, just sharing the journey that you've been on, uh, the amazing book that you put together, the movement that you've created, and just all the things that you continue to do to put this positive message, educational message out into the world. I think it's so important. And I just, uh, I just want to say we appreciate you. Thank you for thank having you. us. <laughs>